Well, welcome to Sabbath School. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we open your word, we just ask your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. And as we discuss these things, may we um, be drawn closer to you, Lord. Your word truly does give us life. And as we uh, hear your voice, we ask that we'll have hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. I should have asked you what you might want to pray for. I'm sorry if I did not give you that opportunity. Um, anything grab you out of the lesson? Anybody here today? We're going to, if you're not, turn to Psalm 134. <laughs> we'll start there today. The, type, the topic of our worship today, at least the lesson title we're studying the Psalms, is Worship never ends. And it says in our psalm, Psalm 34, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. It says, Behold, bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord, you who serve by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion he who made heaven and earth. So, that is sort of the, one of the chapters the, that they ask us to examine this week as we are looking through the Psalms and all the various, pr the prayer life, the worship life, um, in some respects the remembering of history, God, sacred history, all wrapped up in the Psalms. And so today, the idea is focusing on the concept of worship, and according to this lesson, where we worship, and one of the places where we worship, of course, is the sanctuary, where we uh, bless the Lord. It says, all, especially it's calling on the night, the night shift. Those are priests who tend the wicks of the candles, the candlestick that's to be forever burning, they get the night shift. It's a, probably a pretty easy shift. Um, and uh, and we're, they lift their holy hands and they pray all night and they keep the candles burning. And it tells us that uh, we should pray. Of course, it's also, you have Psalm 22, verse 22. It also says, I will tell your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. That is a psalm of David. It's actually a psalm of the cross we know of this time of year. And in verse 25, it says, From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. So emphasis on the idea of worship, which says worship never ends is the theme, and the emphasis of the place of worship is closely tied to the sanctuary. Now I want to blow that up. No. <laughs> in, in a good way. What would be the sanctuary for New Testament Christians? Hmm? The heart. The heart. The heart. Okay. The sanctuary of the heart. Where would I go to find that biblically? I'm not denying it. I'm, I'm not saying you're off track. I'm just saying, where do you go to find that? Romans 12, verse 1. What? Romans 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. We'll read that for us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, why don't you also read for us, since you're there on that one, we'll, take, we'll, we'll look at the sanctuary as the heart. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Read that for us, too. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So 
So your body, your, your actual physical body, your heart, whatever you want to call it, you individually are a temple. So one verse says our body is a sacrifice, and the other says our body is a temple. One says it's a sacrifice, one says it's a temple, or maybe it's what you do with the temple. As there's, there's, there's this idea of sacrifice. So one of the ideas, New Testament ideas for sanctuary, is our actual bodies, okay? Let's hold that. Is there other ideas for New Testament sanctuary? The sanctuary is where God meets with us. It says where two or three are gathered in my name. There oh, okay. So now we have another one. Turn to, you're, 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 you're bringing up Matthew 18, verse 20, but let's, before we go there, John 1, 14. John 1.14 says what? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word, the Logos, became flesh and tabernacled, sanctuaried. So Jesus himself is the sanctuary. Now you take that, and you can look at chapter 2 of John. John chapter 2. I'll read this verse. Verses, it goes this way. John chapter 2. Jesus begins in 13. He goes to Jerusalem. He found the temple. And those who were selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and money changers, etc., he made a strong cords, drove them all out. And he says, take these things away, stop making my father's house a place of business. The disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said, what sign do you show the authority for doing these things? And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, they didn't know what that meant until after he was glorified, because they were saying it took 46 years, and you're going to do it in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. The disciples didn't get that right away until after he was glorified. But the temple of his body, his body is the temple. At least that's what John is teaching. His body, when Jesus walked the earth, was the temple. Okay, so you have, and, and then you have John 4. When we look at the idea of worship in the temple, John 4 in the New Testament says this in verses... 23 and 24, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. How is sanctuary language appropriate for the church on earth? And the answer lies below the surface. Now we're going to go to your passage. Matthew 18, read for us verse 20. We're talking about the concept of sanctuary. We've already established that one idea of New Testament sanctuary is our own bodies. Another idea is Jesus himself personified is the temple. What's this one say in Matthew 18, 20? For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Okay. What is not obvious on the surface is that this is a virtual quotation Jesus is making from rabbinic writings. This statement that Jesus says here where two or three are gathered, the rabbis taught 200 years before that and 200 years after that. Um, it was oral tradition before and it was written down just shortly after the early church starts. But it goes back to probably two to 300 BC. It says, Wherever two or more are gathered to study Torah, Shekinah glory is in their midst. That's what the rabbis taught. And Jesus, uh, the similarity between these two statements, it's been recognized as obvious. There's also differences, though. The two subtle differences between Jesus' statement and the tradition of the rabbis, where the followers of rabbis gather to study Torah, which could either be Moses or the entire Old Testament, followers of Jesus gather in his name. 
his character. Jesus expands Torah to include his life, his death, his resurrection, his rule. All of that is encompassed in who he is. The second feature, so, so in John 5, 39 to 40, Jesus said, and we shared that in our series, you search the scriptures because in the study of the scripture, you think you have eternal life. It's doing you no good, Jesus is saying in that statement. He's not commanding them to search the scriptures. He is telling them, you search them. You dig through them because you think that by just reading scripture, you have eternal life. You're missing the boat because you're not coming to me. Scriptures lead to Jesus, and if you don't receive Jesus, all the scripture reading in the world is nothing more than bibliotry. That's idolatry of the Bible. Idolatry of the text without a relationship. It's like getting all these love letters and never meeting the lover or having a relationship with the lover. So, the second factor, the other subtle difference is the outcome of the gathering. The followers of the rabbis are graced with the presence of the temple Shekinah. The, that was the glory, that was the given the term for the cloud by uh, day and pillar of fire by night that accompanied Israel through the wilderness. That was the idea behind that uh, term. The followers of Jesus are graced by his personal presence. Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, because of their relationship with me, I am in their midst. That's sanctuary. So, you know what's really kind of cool? Right now, yeah. we're a sanctuary. Because yeah. we're gathered in his name in this room. And he's in our midst right now. What's really cool on Wednesday night, sometimes there's only three or four or five but we're gathered in the library, and that's sanctuary, because God's in the midst. Tuesday. Tuesday nights, yes. Jesus functions for his people the way the cloud functioned in the tabernacle temple. He is the revealing of God. So we have the idea that Jesus is the sanctuary, wherever he is in his presence, with his individuals. Our bodies are sanctuaries. That's two possible ways. Let's look at sanctuary in the New Testament and a few other places. 1 Corinthians 3. Let's look at verses 16 and 17. Someone get that for us and read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Okay, the difference between that passage and the passage in chapter 6, where your body is the temple, the you there is second person plural. All, the, all of you, Corinthian believers, the church is the temple. And if you want to, if, and if you're destroying the church, you know, you're not doing a good thing. It's easy to make pot shots at institutions. We expect churches to do better, but actually churches, are they, are they pure and holy and holier than thou, or are they hospitals for sinners? It's what your, what your perspective is. I tend to think a church is better understood as a hospital for sinners than a hotel for saints. And when you look at it one way and think that the church has to be this and that's, the big, that, that's why so many accuse the church of hypocrisy. Because people sort of act like it should be this wonderful place where only perfect people are involved. So what did Jesus have to do? You know, we, we, we read in John chapter 2 already, what did Jesus have to do to the temple in his day when he showed up? He had to cleanse it. He had to drive out all the business and turned it into a house of prayer. 
He had to do it twice. I believe that, you know, this is the one time where I disagree with a lot of scholarship. They all think that he cleansed it only once. I think he cleansed it twice. I think he cleansed it early on in his ministry at an early Passover visit like John records, and then he cleanses it at the end like the synoptics accord right after the triumphal entry. And both times he has to set it right, and it didn't take him long to get back to business. So now we know that the church is the sanctuary. Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 23, will say the same thing. Basically, Ephesians 2, I'll read that one since I'm there. It says here, So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you all, plural, are fellow citizens with the saints and are God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone, in whom the whole building is fitted together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom we also are being built together in the dwelling place for God in the Spirit. So again, we have the sanctuary of our own bodies, the temple of our bodies individually. We have the idea of Jesus being the temple of God, and wherever Jesus is, it's temple. It's temple time. And you have the idea that the church is a temple, but there's more. Hebrews chapter 8, 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 8, 1 and 2. Ephesians 2, that was uh, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, the last verses of the chapter. Someone have for us uh, Hebrews chapter 8, 1 and 2? Could you? Minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. No. Yeah. Yeah, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now of the thing which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set and hacked on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord preached and not man. Okay, so there is this idea of a reality in the somewhere in the universe or somewhere in the reality in the realm of existence where God actually has, and it's including this place called the throne where Jesus is seated. And we are told in chapter 4 of the same book, you know, that it's interesting that we have, I'm going to keep actually keep my hand in Ephesians 2. I'm going to come back to that. But in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things, yet we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Chapter 8 says, Jesus is a priest on a throne, and this is the throne room. This is the divine council room. This is like the, this is like the oval office of, the, of reality, of the universe. And Jesus is seated as high priest there. It's the seat of authority and power. But we have boldness to go in our relationship with him to that very place. So we have... So we have four levels of sanctuary in the New Testament. We have our bodies, we have the presence of Jesus wherever two or three are gathered in his name. We have church, and there is a heavenly reality. So all of these levels apply to the idea. So what's the sanctuary about? What was the original one about that God talked to Moses about? What's sanctuary about? Okay, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. Someone look that up. We've got to get back to basics again. Exodus 25, 8. We want to talk about sanctuary and what it's all about. 
We've got to see purpose. What do we have? You going to read it for us nice and loud back there? Okay, so let them construct a sanctuary for me that I might what? It's, it's dwelling with them. Sanctuary is all about God. So what we want to do is what are the connections between all these four levels of sanctuary? Well, it's worship, yeah, but what is the connection? We're taking human bodies, we're taking small groups, we're taking churches, we're taking heavenly realities, and what are we doing? What, what's the relationship? They're all called sanctuary. They're all called temple. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. For God, there is a close connection, a oneness between where he's at right now. Notice what it says in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, that's that throne of mercy, by the way, because of the great love which he loved us, verse 5 in Ephesians 2, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Messiah Jesus. So from God's perspective, and by faith reality or trusting reality, we already have access and can walk in the presence of God in his realm. When we stop, it's not about physical. We, we get so hung up on the physical and lose the reality of the spiritual. We are at the same time physical and spiritual beings. We're also emotional and we're also social. And you can't separate it out. We don't want to go Greek and get, get, get stuck in Greek arguments on ontology, on being and what it means. You know, they, they, they thought that material was bad, bad body, bad physics. God says, no, your body's good. It's a temple of God. It's, that was countercultural in a Greek world, that your body was a bad reality that you, your spirit and soul need to escape it. God says, no, no, no. They all go together and by faith and by a trusting relationship and believing in who he is, you have access to the very throne of grace and help. Yeah, I think the sanctuary or the temple is always describing how God operates and how he communicates with us. So before there was sin, God met with Adam and Eve directly. There was no temple. Once sin arrived, and they needed a temple to describe how they could get back to God, and then God describes how we're all building blocks in his temple, which is supposedly reaching out to the world to bring people back to God. And then in Revelation, it says we're all part of the New Jerusalem, which is a city with no temple in it because God meets directly with all the people again. So God's getting back to the point where he doesn't need a temple to bring people back to him because he just meets with us directly. And it's all just a metaphor for how he wants to communicate. There, it, it's, it, okay, so I like the idea that you're driving to. It's sort of the idea of temple is metaphor for living presence. And you don't have to wait for the new Jerusalem to experience it. You don't have to wait for church on Sabbath to experience it. And that's where I was going. Okay. Hang on. Okay, okay go ahead. Then I'm going to go to the Okay, we're, gonna, we're, we're transitioning to this idea of worship. All right, Leona.
I didn't quite catch your question. I'm sorry, you're too far away and I don't have my hearing aids in. My le I forgot my left hearing aid didn't get recharged, so they didn't work. Oh, with, with how you explain the temple and that whole perspective, does that mean God is, that, does that, I mean, my perspective, does that mean that God is closer than ever before? God has always been close. He's never been far. His hand has never been too short that it can't save. He's never, he's everywhere present. He's never, there's nothing that catches him by surprise. He doesn't go, oh, I didn't see that coming. He doesn't do that. He doesn't have that real. God is the great I am always present. It's whether or not we are turned toward him. He technically never turns away from us. I never leave you or forsake you. But we turn away from him. We rebel against his presence, his, his authority, his rule, his ways. David. Yeah, God is trying to, t God's dealing, this is, this is part of a cosmic conflict regarding his presence. And there is one and his followers who were banished from his presence because they didn't want to be there. And they chose to be cast out or cast down. Tisai and then Bernita. Yeah, omnipresent, always has been, always will be. Our psalm says all time, not just God's a timeless being. We get hung up on time. He's not. That's why you can have the, it's talking about those who work in the sanctuary and our opening psalm, Psalm 134, the night keepers, the ones who keep the candle burning 24-7. Bernita, you had to. Yeah, always there, always working. Well, we get into this idea of worship. Who worships? Who worships? I want you to look at, let's start in Philippians chapter 2. Who worships? Philippians chapter 2. Someone read for us with an evangelistic voice, nice and loud for everybody. Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. Who worships is the question. Yeah, nice and loud though. Okay, so every knee should bow. Well, read verse 9 for him. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. What's interesting, we're, we're getting into this. God highly exalted. Who did he highly exalt in the greater passage? That's the passage. That's the big passage of Jesus taking off whatever elements of divinity that he needed to to come and be in humanity so we could see and get a reflection of the Father. So, you know, he's cast he, all the way to the death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because of the cross, God highly exalts him at the right hand of God, a name above every name. There's a new name. By the way, Revelation talks about he has a new name coming someday soon that nobody knows but him. And I want to get into that new name moment in a minute, along with the idea of new song. But you have your hand up. Go ahead. I think sometimes when I read this, I think that, well, everybody's just going to admit that Jesus is Christ. Like, do whatever you want, but as long as you say, all right, yeah, Jesus is Lord, that's okay. Um, but I think Jesus said, spoke pretty harshly to people at one point, and said, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's Isaiah. Okay. 
It's more than about being right. Yeah. I had a coworker who used to say that imitation is the grandest form of flattery. Yeah. And they're saying if someone duplicates what you're doing, that's basically the highest compliment that they admit that they approve of what you're doing. Okay. Um, so I think here he's looking for people that demonstrate his character. Who's turn who people who are turning their hearts toward him, turning their face toward him by beholding his face in a mirror. You know, we become changed. You have your, you're waiting to say something? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about, of course, in Ephesians 2, I'm always thinking about this miracle. Why are the dead people raised? They're dead. They're dead. They can't, they can't turn to God that I can see. But they're dead. Mm -hmm. While we were dead, we're dead. Mm -hmm. Do we go back? Yeah? Who worships? I want to go back to my question. Okay. Revelation 5.13. We have too small a picture of who worships. Notice what worships in Revelation 5.13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying. Okay, so, so let's locate it. Every creature where? On? In heaven. On earth. Who are they? <laughs> Just saying. Under the earth. And in the sea. Creature. There is this element where these creatures, when you read, I think it's Isaiah, when we get into Isaiah, it's everything that has the breath of life. There is a profound oneness. There's a close connection between heaven and earth. There is a true way of understanding it. There's a false way. I think the demonic false way is probably the idea of yin and yang and cosmic oneness that the Eastern religions have morphed to. There is a true cosmic oneness because for every, every truth, there's usually a counterfeit and a lie about what makes up that oneness. That's why the people in some of these eastern countries of India or whatever can be quite brutal and quite awful and violent and horrible to each other and just wait for the next reincarnation. Then I'll fix my life. I'll wait till the next reincarnation. I can't stop the cycle. Maybe some distant time in cosmic time I'll enter nirvana. But in the meantime, I'm not just going to blow it off and go and just be brutal and violent. That's why we have a caste system and we think other people less valuable. The Bible blows that up and talks about a oneness that is available now. How is worship oneness? How does worship, how does oneness, how does worship reflect oneness? In what ways might worship deal with this idea of oneness? Um, what is an aspect of worship? Uh, let's go to Psalm 40, verses 1 to 8. We are in the book of Psalms, after all. We ought to go there a little more today. I've been all over the map, but in Psalm. Psalm 40 I want to talk about worship and oneness, but I want to look at some connections. Psalm 40, 1 to 8. You all find it? I'm going to read it out of the New American Standard, not that it's any better than yours, but Psalm 40, 1 to 8. I waited patiently for the Lord. That's for Yahweh. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He bought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my heart, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and tremble and will trust in the Lord. 
How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. I'd like to stop there for a moment. God has thoughts toward you. God has thoughts about you. Does that trigger a, maybe a text in Jeremiah? What text, Vernita? You triggered a text. I want to know what, see the spirits on the same page here. They're singing a harmony. They have a duet going already. You like that little duet going? I know the plans I have. You God has thoughts about you. Plans for what? How good? Real good. Many, Lord, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. If there is none to, there is none to compare with you. I, if, if I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. The plans that God has for you are just as unfathomable as the depths of his love for you. Can't, can't plumb the depths. It's just too much. Talk about over, being overwhelmed in a good way. Then it says, sacrifice and meal offer you have not desired. Wait a minute, didn't you prescribe it? You, you prescribed sacrifice and meal offering. But that's not what you really want. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. That, that almost would get you fired from priesthood in the sanctuary, wouldn't it? If you're working the temple and say, ah, oh, don't bring your sin offerings, don't bring your, hey, where are we going to get our income? Come on, you can't say that. You can see the boss priest, the head priest on the shift say, don't say that, we won't get enough sacrifice. Shh! Why are you singing that song today? I'm just thinking outside the box here. Yeah. Miry clay. Miry. Miry clay. Then I said, this is a messianic psalm, of course, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is in my heart. So the connection of worship and the worshiper, the worshiper what were the purposes, what was the goal of then all those sacrifices and meal offerings, what were they helping us learn or understand? What was God's ultimate desire in that? Yeah, but what do you want to do with that living sacrifice? What did he want to do with his plans and his thoughts for you? Where do you want to put them? How are you going to carry out his plans and thoughts? Where, where, where is that going to actually, how is that going to work? In your, heart. In your heart. It has to be, and that's where he's writing his law. And by the way, when God does that and changes you, verse 3, go back to verse 3, God puts a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to him. I have something to say. Many will hear my testimony and turn to him when I tell them what he's done for me and what he thinks about me and what he's thinking about them. Can I ask a question? Sure. question is, um, the new song, when you speak of the new song, the new song is not, that's my opinion, is not yesterday, it's what he has done for you today. Yep, it's what he's doing Fresh bread, yeah, Leona. New songs come out of new hearts. He gives you, and every day, no, let's go back to the passage in Romans chapter 12. Because this is, this, is, this is getting back to just 
a living, worshipful reality. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, says it this way. Sounds like Sabbath school's out. Therefore I urge you, brethren and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, those plans and thoughts that he's written on your heart, and that what is good and acceptable and perfect. Your life is, in, in, is worship, service, and loving others is every bit as worshipful as coming here and kneeling down or passing a tray or singing songs. By the way, you're going to find a new corollary between names and songs. God let himself be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then he told Moses, but I will not be known to you by that name. I will be known to you who I just redeemed from is, is, uh, out of Egypt, I'm going to be known not as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the God of Israel. There's a whole new reality that he created when he delivered them, and then he gave them a new song called the Song of Moses. When we go to heaven, the book of Revelation, when, we, when the Lamb decides to finally ride a horse, he does not ride a horse in the first century. I'm convicted on that now. People that want to think that the, that the white horse in Revelation 6 verse 1 is the gospel going forward, I think it's a counterfeit horse. Jesus isn't riding a horse yet. He doesn't ride a horse until Revelation. I don't think it's Jesus on the horse because the other horses are occupied by non-Jesus figures too. They all go together. They ride four. They're riding four abreast. But Jesus rides a white horse. I don't think Jesus... We'll find out today in this message today what he actually rides. Today we're going to see his mode of transportation. Having said that, having said that, I forgot my thought. <laughs> the law's on my heart. Every creature underneath the sea worship... Oh, when he rides the white horse, we sing a new song. That's what it is. He has a new name, which he, only he knows, and his new name. And we're going to get new names, and then we're going to get new songs. Because something you, you have to sing about when you have a new name and a new song. When you rise up in the baptistry, you are new. And you have a new name, and you have a new song from God's perspective. You are no longer called forsaken or abandoned. That's the prophetic uh, Isaiah 62. You are now Beloved, you are now a child of God, and God gives you a new song to go with your new reality. You were once dead, and now you're alive. All right, I, I think we're done. The clock has run out. I'm, if that clock is close to right, I'm over. So let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come before you, we realize, Lord, that there's nothing in us which is desirable apart from you. And yet you invite us to come boldly, to be changed, to be made new, to have a reason to worship. You invite us to the very belonging with you on all levels. And so, Father, we come to right now before this place of grace, this throne of grace where you sit, and yet you not only sit up there, you're right here among us, and Lord, you dare say you are in us through your Spirit. We pray that we would take time to acknowledge that sacred presence. And that we would allow, as we look upon Jesus today, and as we look upon him through the faces of the, each other, and as we come before you, that you would draw our, our eyes to see open our ears to hear, and then, Lord, break forth our tongues to sing praises to your name. May then our hands and feet go out in worship services of just loving others as you've loved us. 
So we ask for your spirit to accomplish these good things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning, and thank, thank you, you so much, Kayla. Love it. Singing, morning, I Happy love Sabbath. you, Lord. Welcome to the Bremerton Seventh Avenue Church. I want to welcome those who are online and those who are here in person. And Good we morning. have a lot of people out in the hallways and byways, and we'll bring them in too. We also have a lot of people gone because you know what it is it's spring break. Oh. Yes. That began, and therefore you had the mass exodus of all these families that go on vacation other places and take opportunity to leave the wonderful Pacific Northwest, which is kind of rainy today and not as wonderful as some days, but <laughs> at least for kids to play. Yes. But we don't mind the rain. We just have several announcements uh, we want to bring to your attention. We have prayer meeting again on Tuesday night still, even though some people are breaking and spring breaking. Uh, we are still continuing on. Hospitality luncheon. Um, I just got a text from Debbie yesterday. Brad is sick today. Oh, it's, it's, he is sick, and they have to cancel the hospitality that they were planning to have done today. So, so. it's in the bulletin, but we're letting you know it's been canceled, unfortunately, due to illness. Um, Sunday, April 21st, coming up in a, f a few weeks, less than a month, there is a baby shower because Jessica... Um, had twins or is having twins i don't know if it's had or having but they'll what having having, having <laughs> twins yes. and so they're going to get prepared for that reality which is going to hit them like a wall pow twins <laughs> one's like none my mom said and two's like 10. <laughs> so they're going to experience 10 right off the bat anyway that is coming up and those are the announcements we have you have another one though i have uh, Miss Catherine here. Um, I'm going to invite her to go ahead and make an announcement for herself. What she got going on. Hello, church. My name is Catherine. This is my husband, Levi. And we had been attending an SDA church in Seattle for a while. We would drive an hour and a half there and an hour and a half back. And thankfully, a few months ago, we became aware of this church, and everyone has been so welcoming. We're so glad that we can come here and be part of the worship with you. So now we want to extend the invitation to you to come to our home. We are starting uh, every Friday a little Vespers, like a instead of a Netflix and chill, it's going to be a Bible and chill at our home. Uh, Fridays at 6 p.m. Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, starting on the 29th of this month. So if you want more information of where it is, or if you would like um, to come any Friday, just reach us at the end of of worship service, and we'll give you our address and our contact information. All right. Thank you. Thank Sounds you. exciting. You, Sounds exciting. Wonderful. By the way, our school, our, I, my understanding, I haven't gotten updates, uh, partly because I'm not on Instagram, but uh, I guess we got off safely at the airport. They took off, and we have a mission trip going on as well in El Salvador, and it's lovely. A dozen people from our church in Port Orchard are all on their way there, so... That's another thing going on. We want to keep them in our prayers and the blessing that they'll be a blessing and be blessed. Do we have any other announcements? A couple weeks from now? I want to touch base with, uh, well, I need to touch base with Ron, uh, Rachel, and Robert eventually, and I'm going to find out if they want to also do communion on the first Sabbath of April. Okay. We'll tentatively plan it that day, leave the first Sabbath or the second Sabbath of April, our quarterly service. I'm going to preach next week, and then we'll do communion either the following Sabbath or the one after that. All right, with no other, uh, though we be a little fewer number, we're still going to sing praises to God. I, Leona can call us to worship, but before she does, I want to invite uh, JC and Bella up as our praise team. And if any other kids want to come up and join us and sing, we're going to have a kid's praise today. And what I also need is someone to click the picture screens. I will give that to... Okay. Yeah, if you just click when we get to that part. All right. You can see. Call us to worship. Okay. You can call the pastor. Okay, I would like to invite our congregation to please stand with us for our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning, scripture text will be found in the book of Psalms, Psalm 24, chapter 1 and 1 to 5. Psalms 24, chapter 1 and 1 to 5. 
And it says, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Uh, I would like to invite the congregation to please bow your heads with us and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, everything in this world, they're all yours. And God, you have provided everything that we need to come and dwell in your house, in this temple, to worship you. For, for God, all the blessings and the vindication, we receive that from you. So we ask that you bless our time here together in your presence as we call to worship you with deep reverence for you, um, for all the glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remain standing for our first song. All right. Now we raise this humble thyself with our God is an awesome God. You ready? Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And He Let's 
wish I tell Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. To light up my Good morning. Okay, I think our, our worship and offerings today is for local um, conference advance, not Washington News. Um, so our com um, there are many things happening in our world today, and if we focus on the turmoil, it can become very discouraging. Yet God encourages us with these words from the book of Isaiah 26, 3. It says, you will keep in peace those minds who are steadfast because they trust in you. So together, we can run this race together. And one way to support one another is by giving to the local conference advance. Local conference advance is a sisterhood of local churches that help each congregation within its boundaries to accomplish important objectives that are beyond the reach of any one church alone. It goes to support ministries that serve our region and touch people's lives. And some examples of this is our summer camp, which many of us have been to, um, evangelists in our local community, vacation, Bible school, and all these special projects. And the largest portion goes to fund um, Christian education. So we ask that you consider that in your giving plan today with the means and the wealth that God has blessed you with. So may the deacons please come forward. Oh, and the kids will be collecting money, will be coming around collecting money for the school scholarship. Uh, please bow our heads and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's so encouraging knowing that we are not running this race alone, and we are running with you. And one way we're looking to support and, and um, each other and touch people's lives is through um, giving to the local conference advance, and you ask that you bless the little that we give for your purpose and your ministry. And we thank you for Jesus who made all these things possible for us. So bless the offering and bless each and every one today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Am I on? Yes, I am. How many of you have a dog, your very own personal dog that lives with you? Most of you have a dog. I don't have a dog anymore, but I used to have two dogs. And my story today is inspired by dogs because I, I went to San Francisco to spend some time with my mom, and she has a little dog that looks kind of like a little coyote, and she named her Wiley because <laughs> that's just what she reminds her of. Anyway, a long time ago, I saw this picture in a magazine. It was in, I don't even know if it was one of our church magazines, but it was a big, beautiful golden retriever. And you know how dogs, when they expect you to come home, are you guys watching me? Where do you think, if you're coming home and you're getting ready to knock at the front door and your dog's in the house, where do you think the dog is? At the front door. That's right. And this was a picture of a big, beautiful golden retriever waiting at the door, probably going, uh, 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 whiny, because he knew who was coming on the other side. And it was a story, it was relating the dog to us in relation to Jesus. And it said, the dog doesn't always know what's on the other side of that door. There could be happy times or sad times or scary things, but he also knows his master is coming through that door. So he's willing to do whatever it takes to be with his master again. And usually when we have a pet, they have a favorite person in the family, don't they? They have their person. They might be a family dog, but do they usually have a favorite person? JC, what do you think? Does your dog have a favorite person in your family? Who is it? Your grandma. <laughs> my dogs became my, my dogs, too. Even though they belonged to my daughters originally, I became their person. But anyway, when I was down with my mom, she has this little dog that looks like a coyote, and every time we would come back to the apartment when we'd been gone for a little bit, Just coming down the hall, the dog could recognize my mom's footsteps coming down the hall. She knew that we were coming, and we could hear her going, "Ah, ah, ah, ah," because she was so excited. And we'd come in the door, and she'd leap out on my mom and and jump up on her. She's not a very big dog. And my mom would reach down and give her kind of a doggy hug and ruffle her fur. And then Wiley was just, she would just go nuts. She'd race down the hall and race back and jump up and go, and race down the hall and race back and go. Ruff, 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 ruff. She was just so excited, even if we were only gone 10 minutes. It's like her person was home and she was happy. She was overjoyed. And she's like, oh, all is right with my world again. <laughs> so I want you guys to think about that in our relationship with Jesus, that he is our person. And we can trust him no matter what. We don't get to see him yet, but we will get to see him when we go to heaven, won't we? When he comes down to take us back to heaven, we're going to get to see him face to face, and we can be so excited. And some of us might just sit and go, oh, and some of us might just run around like crazy or dance and just be so full of wiggles and so excited, just like the dogs. And Jesus would love to see us being that excited to see him, wouldn't he? So I want you to remember that when you see an animal who's so excited to be with their person, that that's how we should be with Jesus. That's what he wants from us. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Thank you so much for that story. It made me remember my dog. Oh my goodness. I had a dog named Harmony. She was a great big white Samoyed. And when she got excited, it seemed like every one of her many, many, many hairs would just kind of stand up and jiggle. She thought I hung the moon. And there's not many that think that, so it was very nice. The neat thing about God is Um, We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait to see him in heaven. He can be right here. Let's just bow our heads or our knees or any part of us that we want to. And I'll talk a little bit to God. Lord of the universe, we want to praise you today because we have so very many blessings. We're here. We are warm. I'm betting we're well fed. We have a God that cares about every little thing and experience that happens to us. 
who came, who died, and wants us to grow more. We're asking, sorry, excuse me. We pray for our kids that they may be safe, that they may feel your love today. And we pray for all of your kids that very same way. We ask that you fill this place and us with your spirit. Open our ears to hear what is said today and then open our hearts to love any of those that you bring us. Amen. Protect thee forever, wipe every falling tear. He will forsake thee, O oh, never, sheltered so tenderly there. Haste then, the daylight is flying. Spend not the moments in sighing. Cease from your sorrow and crying. The Savior will wipe every tear. Yes, Jesus will wipe every tear. Good morning. Let's see. Today's scripture reading is from Psalms 65, 1 through 8. There will be silence before you and praise in Zion, O God, and to you the vow will be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all men come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our tra transgressions, you forgive them. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you. To dwell in your courts, we will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us in righteousness, O God of our salvation. You who are the trust of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest sea, who establishes the mountains by his strength, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. Oh. 
you have a blank screen right now. And wow, we have green chair time. And no one, if you look, they're as empty right now as they are in the picture. So what are we going to do? We're still going to have green chair time. So what we're going to do is that the one, ah, someone took the green chair. Well, we have something for you. We have a green chair surprise that you have to share. No, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> that is sneaky. That's sneaky. That was sneaky. The green chair surprise for you is that you have to share that. But you get to play with that and share that. That's the one thing you have to do. You have a harder green chair surprise because you're going to need adults to help you. <laughs> do you know what your green chair surprise is? Do you know what that says there on the corner there? Do you know what that means? What is that, do you know? That's a gift card. That's a present, isn't it? And it's worth $25, but you know what you have to do? You got to spend that on some and give it give something to someone. Okay? Can you do that? Can you go with your mom and say and you can you and your mom and your dad can go out and find someone that needs something and you get to share it with them, okay? So you have to talk that over with your mom and dad and go somewhere with them and take that $25 gift card and do some ministry with it. It was green chair time. No food this time, no treats, no edible treats. She feels ripped off. They got Play-Doh and she got a car that she has to give away. <laughs> Maybe another day you'll get... Now we have... We, they're, they're, the kids will catch on. The adults will avoid the chairs. What we're going to do in the near future is though, maybe we're going to count like eight over to one way or the other from the chair, three or four back or forward, and we'll just, you could be in a random chair. It might even go on the balcony because there is no green chair up there, but there are green pews. We could just turn it into a green pew up there and just choose the person. All right. It's hard to leave this series on the Old Testament, though I technically finished it. I want to talk about a spectacular entrance and I don't know quite how my slides and my notes are going to match. I have four pages of notes, technically three, two and a half to three. And I'm debating whether to stay with my scripture reading or just go totally ad hoc. Let's see here. Let's start with the scripture. We're going to review the scripture that Kayla read for us. I'm going to share my combo version of this scripture. It's a combination of the New American Standard and the New Revised Standard. And I'm taking what I think are the better Hebrew phrases from each. And so it starts with silence. Silence is due use. That's better than praise is due use. Some say praise. Some of your translations. I think the word is better translated silence. Because so you know what? Sometimes silence is praise. When you are so gobsmacked, when you are so jaw-dropped, eye-bugged out, you have no words to express the amazing thing that you just experienced from God. Silence is due you, O God in Zion, and you shall be, and you, and to you shall vows be performed. Now, vows are promises. In other words, the people that have been silenced are now going to start speaking up and they're going to start making promises because, and these are in the forms of gratitude. God has done something so amazing that. They have to respond with promises. God, you're so good. I just want to be. I just want to do. I just need to say. I don't know what that is. You'll have to decide from what God has done. Why? Because you are a God who answers prayer. And because he's a God who answers prayer, the psalmist David declares to you all flesh will come. If you think about that in Sabbath school, who worships God according to Revelation 5.13? Those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, <laughs> and in the sea, all flesh comes to worship because God does something so amazing, does things that are so amazing. Then the psalmist David turns toward himself and realizes for a moment where he's at, who he's been, and what he's been about. 
when deeds of iniquity overwhelm me, when he starts looking at his own life, the psalmist is overwhelmed with shame and guilt. The word there, I like the word overwhelm. Some of your versions don't have it, but it's a flood word. When I am flooded, when I've had it up to here, my head's, my nose and my eyes are the only thing looking up because all the rest of me is caught in the mire of my awfulness. The next phrase is, you forgive or you cover our transgressions. He is, uh, the word is atone. It's it's the same word for mercy seat. You mercy seat my misery. You mercy seat. In other words, where, Paul will say this, where sins abounds, grace abounds much more. And, And then, of course, sin's the bottom of the sea. When I'm overwhelmed, God plucks me up and lets my sins sink. And they're no more. And so he breaks out, blessed is the one you choose to bring near. And by the way, the one that I capitalize, because this is probably a messianic phrase. The one he's bringing near is the one he's going to put on the throne next to him to live in your courts. It's probably related to Psalm 2 and to us in Ephesians 2. God's going to pluck us out of the mire and put us on high ground. We're enthroned with him. That's the idea of this psalm. It's a great, beautiful psalm, isn't it? And it goes on. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance. O God of our salvation. Of course, that's Hebrew parallel, so deliverance means salvation. And we're going to get into that in a minute. You are the hope of the ends of the earth. All flesh is coming to him. And how far does that go? It goes all the way to the ends of the earth. It sounds almost like a Three angels flying in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel to preach to them who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. He's going everywhere, the ends of the earth. And there's hope that results when the good news goes to the end of the earth and the farthest seas. There's not a place where God doesn't want his goodness and his his remarkable mouth-stopping, eye-popping activity to occur and the news of his salvation. By your strength you establish the mountains, in other words, high ground again, for drowning people. There are people out there just drowning, and God wants to give them some high ground. You are girded with might. Talks about his power. But it's, there's some more, a little bit more. You, God, silence the roaring of the seas, the ones that are overwhelming us. If you have a guilty heart today, There's a God who silences the roaring of the seas that are beating on your heart right now. The roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples. It's linked to the silence that is praise when I realize that God forgave a wretch like me. Don't have much to say. Just stand there and go, wow. How can you do that? I have a hard time forgiving myself. But it's praise. So is shouting. Shouting is praise too. Those who live on the earth's farthest bounds. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be the farthest from God. By the way, he's everywhere present. So even when you go to the farthest bounds, he's there. We talked about that in Sabbath school. We are awed by your signs. That's his uh, demonstration of his power. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. Beginning and ending our day. So that's the psalm. It's a great one. And it was a, it was a day of greatness. It was a day when people were shouting for joy. It was a day when people were thinking salvation is finally here. It was a day... That, we, that the world is celebrating this weekend. They call it Palm Sunday. It was a day when Jesus showed up as Jerusalem to take the throne in the court of God. He's going to sit on the throne. He's finally going to do what those disciples wanted him to do. When are you going to declare yourself the Christ? When are you going to start implementing your kingdom? Is your kingdom coming? And he says, today's the day. And so, and it was prophesied in the Old Testament. 
It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Well, actually, that's not what the words say. Humble and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples were probably wondering, wait, 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 wait. The, the king we're looking for, the Messiah we're looking for, should be coming on a big steed, a big white horse. He should be riding a white horse into town. What's this donkey stuff? Hmm. Hmm. New Testament writers, you see, have one huge interpretive principle. New Testament writers have one huge interpretive principle. They had an experience with Jesus, Messiah. He was God who became human. And so all the New Testament writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of them, Paul, somewhere, somehow, gain a relationship with Jesus Christ and it tempers and changes every way they read the Old Testament and how they understood it. They learn to read the Old Testament through the lens. Now there's two things out there. I want to give you a little history and a little teaching. Just leave that up there for now. Allegory and type. We don't believe that allegory is a good way to read the scripture. We need to understand the types. Allegory is reading yourself into the text and seeing what you want to see. Typology is what inspiration tells you you need to see to make a connection. That's one way of understanding what a type is. It's telling you what to, typology is grounded on inspired permission, where a prophet points out that this is how we are to understand the symbol, the analogy, the figurative language. An example would be very simply, Jesus as the Lamb of God. The Lamb somewhere is a type, and it's a Passover Lamb. That is the type. What does the Passover Lamb do? It provides deliverance. It was the sacrifice that provided deliverance or salvation. That's why, and it points to the work of Jesus, and that's how it works. That's an example. Type, and uh, allegory became real popular, though, and around 200 years before Jesus, Philo uh, allegorized the whole life of Moses and made him into a Greek philosopher to evangelize Greeks to Judaism. He adopted the allegorical method, which was very Greek, and applied it to Moses and tried to win Greeks to Judaism. Origin. 100 years after Jesus, 150 years after Jesus, Will, one of the church fathers also tried taking a lot of the New Testament gospel and allegorizing it to help win Greeks. And, and he kind of got us into this idea of you have a soul, you, not you, you are a soul. That's his fault. But he has a lot of good things he's written, but he also has some bad things that we don't believe in or follow that aren't biblical. We have Adventist allegories too, by the way. An Adventist allegory is, you ever hear of the great week of time? The great week of time? It's based on an allegorized reading of one passage of Scripture. That passage is Psalm 90, verse 4. A day in the Lord is like a week. I mean, I mean a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. I'm oh, sorry. And so we, uh, we assume that, okay, let's see. There's... We are approaching year 6,000. It became popular by J.N. Andrews in, 19, in 1882 in the Review and Herald in the Adventist new, uh, paper that went to the church. He, he uh, wrote an article on how that we are nearing the 6,000th year of existence on earth because he added up all the dates and the genealogies and connected all those dots and he assumed that in 1885 was going to be the 6,000th year maybe Jesus is going to come then because that would usher in the 7,000th year which sure seems like heaven and it seems like it fits with the thousand years in Revelation and stuff like that and you know what Ellen White also agreed with that as one of the founders of our church in some ways. 
and she used to speak of the earth being almost 6,000 years, and then after 1885, a little more than 6,000 years. And you know what? That's, it's not wrong to think that because that's historically biblical in the sense you're adding up what the Bible does give you. The issues you might have, though, with that is what chronology are they using? Are they using the Masoretic text? Are they using the Samaritan Pentateuch? Or are they using the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament? Because depending on what version of the Old Testament you're doing to get your numbers from, you will have about a 1600 year difference. So maybe we're already into year 7,500, or maybe we're not quite, you know, it just depends what version you use. And by the way, the New Testament writers used both the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. They did not use the Babylonian Pentateuch. But th even those two have over a thousand years of difference. The reality is, is that's allegory. That's allegory, and some Adventists hold to it today that one day is, th for, uh, is a thousand years, you know, uh, in God's time, you know, it's like a thousand. But that's not what the text says. Um, the text says the point of the text is not a day is a thousand years, but a day is like a thousand years. And the point of the passage is God does not do time like we do time. God is timeless. That's the point of Psalm 90, verse 4. The verse is not connected to the creation account or the weekly cycle. So you can't go there and use that as the great year of time. And we've kind of, we kind of given up a little bit. It's not so popular now that we've been moving about 100, over 120 some, 140 some years since the 6,000th year, and we, Jesus still isn't here in the sense that we want him to be here. But that's, that's allegorical. The New Testament gives types for guidance, not allegory, to help us understand figurative language. New Testament does this. Matthew 1, verse 1 is a clear statement. Biblos Genesis Jesus Christu, the genesis of Jesus Christ, who will later be called the son of David and the son of Abraham. And those, a lot of those words are types. The word genesis takes you back to creation. It's purposely quoting Genesis 1.1 because it wants you to associate Jesus with creation and creator. John does the same thing in the beginning. He says, uses the same phrase. And they don't use the Greek word as well. There is a Greek word for creation. Neither of them use it. They use the begot word uh, for it. And they also, you have the name Jesus. Jesus, his name is an Old Testament name. What, who is Jesus? What's his Old Testament name? How would you pronounce it? Joshua, which is the word, the word, the word uh, Joshua is Hosan and Yahweh which means saves, Yahweh saves, or the Lord saves. Joshua saves. So his name itself is a type. Joshua is a type. Jesus is related to Joshua, the successor of Moses. What did Joshua, what's he famous for? He bought Israel into the promised land. Jesus will save God's people and bring them into the promised land. That's how the type works. The name Christ is a type. In a sense, it's a mess, mess, Messiah, Christus. It's the anointed one, the spirit-rubbed one, and prophets, priests, high priest, and king are all types. Now, some are more types than others. There was a type, the, 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 promised, the promised priest in the proph prophecy of, uh, of uh, Jeremiah 23, a branch will come from David or Jesse, that's the offspring, is a kingly type, but, and, he's, and he will go by the name the Lord our righteousness. There happened to be a king in Jeremiah's day who was actually had the name Zedekiah, which means the Lord our righteousness. But the only thing that he was a symbol or a type of Jesus was his name. He was one of the most unrighteous kings of the entire Israel history. So you got to understand how they work and how they don't work. But the offices of Moses, Aaron, and David come to mind when you have prophet, priest, and king. Son of Abraham, who was the son of Abraham? Isaac. Two ways Isaac is like Jesus. A miraculous birth, and he goes up the hill with Abraham to die as a sacrifice, giving of himself. 
Son of David. Who was the son of David? Solomon. How is Solomon a type of Jesus? He is the one who is to build God's temple. Jesus builds God's temple. You are living stones if you are followers of Jesus Christ who are being built into the temple of God. That's how the type works. So I just wanted to explain that a little bit, how Old Testament and New. Um, also, Solomon is known for his reign. It's peace. And the Messiah is also the prince of peace or a king of peace. So we have a little bit of theology, a little bit of teaching behind us. How is Jesus like David? Well, if he's a type, he, a branch will come from David. It's always a prophet or a scriptural reading from New Testament or Old that gives you the guide. It tells you it's a type so you can make the connection and not fall into allegory. And so for like David, the son of David, you have Isaiah 11.1 1, and Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, the idea of a branch. How is David, Jesus like a son of David? Well, he's not like David in adultery and murder. He's not like David, but he is a victorious king. And um, the, another big difference, you know, um, uh, you have also uh, Moses. In which way is Jesus, is Moses a type? God says in Deuteronomy, it says, Moses writes, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me. And so they expected the Messiah to be something one like Moses. So he is a priest. So I wanted to look at one more example. Isaiah 65, verse 17, has a very interesting type, Old Testament type. And it fits this weekend of this king coming in. Isaiah 65, 17 says, For behold, we're going to see how this fits in a minute. I'm going to connect all these Old Testament dots because this is how the New Testament writers thought. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. That is a messianic prophecy about God creating as creator. But Jesus is also not only the creator, he is the new creation. Do you get that fine-tuning there? Does that make any sense? What? Well, you have, the, you have the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and... He, made, he was responsible for everything. Nothing came into existence. I, we should have our brother come up there and quote the whole chapter for us again, but we'll save him that today. But thank you, that was memorable. Um, Jesus is the creator and the creation. Matthew, by the way, by going the genesis of Jesus is taking you back to the idea of creation as well. And he is creating here, it says, he creates a new heaven and a new earth. He is the uh, ruler who does this. He is the Messiah who does this. And John uses the word become. The word became flesh. Um, and, they, and that's the word that the Septuagint uses for creation, um, God's work in creation. So Matthew and John have Genesis 1 in mind. Jesus is not only creator, but new creation. Why does Jesus call himself, I am the light of the world. What did you do on the first day of creation? Let there be. He's the new creation. He is the true light, which lights every man. That's how type works. That's how they thought. Jesus is a new creation. He's a new light. Anyone who comes who is thirsty, come and what? Drink. He's the water of life. And you need that. And so that's, that's the idea. You get the gist of it. And so it's like these New Testament writers were saying, um, he is the, we saw the new heavens and new earth walk among us in the person of Jesus. He was the new creation and he is the creator. And if you doubt that, let's look at one more passage. 
2 Corinthians, this is pretty wild, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, go there real quick in your Bibles, follow along here. We're going we're gonna to bring this home real powerfully. Then we're going to get on the, then we're going to go and do this triumphal entry thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. We know if this earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, an eternal one in heaven. For indeed in this house we groan, we long to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. We want to we wanna get plucked from the muck and the mire of this earth. And then if you skip down, notice verse 16 and 17. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we once had known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is what? A new creation. The old things have passed away. All has become new. You get a new name and you get to sing a new song. Because you are now tied to the one who is the new creation. You're tied to Jesus. Notice how it worked. It worked in ways like this. Simon Peter, recorded in Matthew 8, Luke 5. Simon Peter's home. And crowds were at the door. And Jesus was just inside the house. And there was a packed with people. They couldn't, they, four guys got late to the party and they had, a, they had a, a man who was a paralytic. You know the story, right? And so they couldn't get in. They said, hmm, what do we do? Let's go to the roof. They go up on top of the roof. They tear open a hole in the roof, and they lower the man on his mat through the roof onto the floor at the feet of Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the new Joshua, the Savior of Israel. And so he pronounces and begins his work of salvation. He says to the man laying on the floor in front of him, your sins are forgiven. The man was, he was drowning in his paralysis and his guilt and his shame and his brokenness. And he's going to get lifted and plucked up and set on that high ground. But Jesus knew the thoughts of those who were around him, who didn't believe he was Messiah. And they were thinking, how can this man forgive sin? Only God can do that. They were thinking blasphemy. And Jesus is thinking salvation. And so Jesus knew their thoughts, so because he's God. And so he says to them, which is easier? to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. But to let you know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins and save people from their sins and pluck them out of the muck and mire of shame, I say to you on the mat, get up and walk. And that man popped up and he stood up on new creation legs. Because he was a new creation. And he said, Jesus said, take up your mat. And he rolls it up and he marches out the door with a new creation arm on new creation legs. That's how new, a new creator and new creation work. If anyone is in Christ, Paul said, they're a new creature. Their sins are forgiven. Not might be, just as popped up to that guy was so forgiven, he could walk again. He wasn't drowning in his shame, self-pity, tears of, drowning in his own tears of self-pity and remorse. He rose up. Now all the tears were sheer joy, fertilizing the ground with a testimony. He was probably just silenced. He probably just had tears streaming down his face, a smile on his lips as he walked out that door. And his friends were doing all the hallelujah and hosanna up on the roof and jumping off to join their new walking friend. Okay. Who said this? You are to give him the name Jesus. Who said that? 
Who said that? God said it. Who did he say it through? Who was he using to say that? It was an angel named Gabriel. Who was he talking to? You're going to give, you will have a child and you will name him Jesus. Who's he talking to? Joseph. Just to get the gender straight here. It was Joseph. Read Matthew 1. God was saying to Joseph, you will name your, this, this child of yours who the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters of chaos and creation arose. Holy Spirit, Luke says in Luke chapter 1, is hovering, the same word in the Greek, Old Testament Septuagint, and there is hovering over Mary and Messiah is conceived. And you're going to name him Jesus, which means Hosin, which is the word for salvation, and the word Yahweh, or, or translated in your Bible, Lord. By the way, Jehovah, just to get that straight, some of your Bibles will say Jehovah. That is, that, you know where that comes from, right? After a while, some of the rabbis thought it was too sacred to say the name Yahweh, so they would put the word Adonai, which was the word for Lord, below it to let everyone know you don't read the name Yahweh when you're reading the psalm. You read the word Adonai. You say Adonai. But then later on, scribes started just tying the vowel points of Adonai into the consonantal language of Hebrew into Yahweh, and you get the word Jehovah. But that was not because it was God saying you have to say the name Jehovah. I have a sneaking suspicion God doesn't mind if you call him Yahweh because he's the one that gave, told Moses that was his name. And that's what you're going to tell Israel who sent me, who sent you to them. But some people get real serious about it. I don't worry about it. You can call him Jehovah. His name was probably Yahweh. But it basically, Yahweh saves was the name you're going to give Jesus. The Holy Spirit hovered. Yahweh saves. And so whenever you read the word Lord in your King James Version or New King James in the Old Testament, it's the word Yahweh. Sometimes it will be translated Jehovah. Jesus then now comes. So now we get him coming. It's, uh, first of all, Luke, I mean, uh, Matthew will combine this passage here. Rejoice greatly, because now Jesus is finally getting around to doing what they thought he was going to do as Messiah. He's going to save the world. His name is Savior. They're expecting him to get up and start ruling like the king that's going to save them. And and so they have this passage in mind quoted in Matthew and this one here. Go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up the standard of the people. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Remember that psalm we read earlier that Kayla read for us? It's to the ends of the earth, to every nation, kindred, time. He wants that road to be smooth all the way to the farthest reaches where people are found that are drowning in their own iniquity and feeling guilty and lost and horrible. Amen. Smooth the road. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation. Jesus comes. His reward is with him. He's the one that can walk into your home and your paralysis and your brokenness and say, get up. And on new creation legs, you can get up. Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense is before him. So we have the story. Matthew. Go to the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Matthew is the only one that records both animals there. Most likely it was just one. But Matthew records it. It might have been that way. Untie them and bring them to me. He wasn't sitting on two. He was riding one. Um, whether or not the other one accompanied, we don't know. The other Gospels only record one. But if anyone says to you, what are you doing? The Lord has need of them. Immediately he will send them. They took place to fulfill what was spoken of through the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. That's the quote in Isaiah 62. Gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So they want Jesus to proclaim his kingship, and he's now riding into town to become king. It's Palm Sunday, and as he rides into town, he's not riding on a horse as a warrior to drive out them rascally Romans. He's riding on a 
donkey, animal of choice, donkey known to be a beast bearing, a burden bearing beast, a service animal. Jesus is a service animal. He does have one here. Most of the crowd started doing, by the way, what, were the, what was the crowd doing? They were going through, they were removing the stones, they were, lift, they were building the highway. How were they building the highway? They were taking their coats in the roads, they were cutting off branches from the trees, they're making the path smooth for the king to go and rule. And they're making the path smooth. The crowds are going ahead of them. And those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know what Hosanna means. Yahweh save. Jesus, Jesus. His name shall, no other name in heaven whereby men might be saved. It's Jesus. It's Yahweh saves. He's the only one who can save, who can lift you up out of the muck and the mire of your brokenness. He's the only one. He brings forgiveness. He brings his reward. When he had entered Jerusalem, the city was stirred. Actually, the word there is earthquaked. Because you imagine, when you read the story in John, his entrance story, you have Lazarus present too, probably leading the parade. Here is a new creation man, four-dayer, stinker in the tomb, is now leading the parade. It's nice and clean and squeaky clean and hiking right along. You had the new creation man humbly walking with the donkey and the Savior into town. And the crowd's asking, who is this? They're quaking. It's, it, it's a stir. It's a quake. It's, it's like an earthquake. You could, you, you, it's like it's just reverberating out. Jesus is is coming into town as Messiah King. And that has everybody jazzed. Who is this? And the crowds are saying, this is, they called him the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee, which creates other problems. Luke's version says, as he was going and spreading their coats, as they're making the road, he's approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with loud shouts of voices of all the miracles they had seen. It's not a time to be silent. It's a time to shout. It's a time to shout. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. It's, it's, and glory to the God in the highest. And some Pharisees in the crowd said, Teach your rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said, If I tell you, these, if these stones become silent, the stones... I mean, you know, if these become silent, the people become silent, the stones will cry out. And then he gets to approach Jerusalem. He gets to that descent, and he looks to the city and wept over it. He stops, and he starts weeping. He was, this is what he was seeing. That's from the Garden of Gethsemane. He's getting ready to go down the hill. It goes way down. It comes way up. There's Barb. That's what she's looking at. That's my wife when we went to Israel a few years back. And she's sitting in the garden of Gethsemane and the stones are there. And those stones would have cried out if the people weren't praising God. And she's looking across and technically what the temple was right, if this is going to work, yeah, there. The temple was actually over here. That's the spot, that, that's where the ram and the thicket was supposedly thought, or where Abraham was going to build an altar. But this is the spot where the temple probably was, and where, that's where he's going. So that's, uh, and, I, and there's Barb, and I was at the tree just like that one. I took a picture of her, but we were both there for a while, and we were both praying. That's what you do when you're on the Mount of Olives. That's what we did anyway. I can even tell you what I prayed. I won't this day, but maybe another. The Messiah is coming and the earth is quaking. The salvation bringer, Yasha, the word for salvation, Joshua is coming, meek and gentle, humble on a foal of an ass, a beast of burden, 
Because Isaiah says, surely he's bearing our griefs and carrying our sorrow, our tears that are overwhelming us. And we're in the mire of our own making, our own brokenness, creating a muck and a mire that we can't get out of, addictions we can't break, brokenness, violence, anger, jealousies, pettiness. But he's come to bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. He's a Savior who is going to make all that is wrong right. He is a righteous king, the Lord, our right maker. When we're overwhelmed and drowning in sin, the burden bearer comes, sucks up all the tears and pulls us out of the mire and sets us up on new creation legs. He lives up to his name. It was a, you know, when you think about it, it was a spectacular entrance on a donkey, a slow, methodical beast of burden. It's, it's actually a servant. The donkey is the servant animal. It was anywhere for, it, it cost you two months wages up to two years wages depending on the age and the size to own a donkey in Jesus' day. And he's on a young one which means it had a lot of life left but it was strong enough. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the word. It's, it's quite a spectacle to see. We're observing it. You know, it was, it, it was, we get the word spectacular from spectacle, which can mean great and remarkable, but it's also stunning. He's not on a horse. He's on a service animal. We could get the words fantastic and dramatic and brilliant and marvelous and breathtaking. Maybe we have a bigger view. We have the spectrum of the whole journey. The trouble with Israel is that they had eyes that couldn't see. They mechanically worked, but they just didn't see how broken and how far they were from God. Living up to his name, though, Jesus, Yahshua, came to save. Joseph was called to tell him, to give him the name Jesus. He will save his people from their sin. And so Peter, you know, when he's... He's on the, he's, the disciples had just fed the 5,000 in the Decapolis area, and, and, and they're coming across, they fed people over, no, they, no, they, they, they the demoniac, excuse me, they cued the demoniac, they're coming back across to go to Capernaum, and a big storm blows up on the sea, and Jesus is in the boat, and they wake him saying, Lord, save us. And he speaks and calms, as our psalm said today in Psalm 65, the roaring waves. And the disciples were silenced, thinking even the winds and water obey him. He's a new creation creator. He can shape water and wind. And of course, another time, Peter is on a stormy sea and he gets out in the boat and he starts sinking and he cries out, Jesus, save me. Reach out your hand. And he saves him. Because in Acts 4.12, there is no name under heaven given whereby people can be saved. So Jesus' animal of choice is not a white horse. Jesus doesn't send the church out on white horses in the first century. He sends them out two by two, and if they're lucky, they have a donkey. Let's change and personalize the scene a little bit. Are there places in the world where you would like to see Jesus riding in on a donkey right now? Maybe he could take a road trip through sub-Saharan Africa. Or maybe to Yemen, or Syria. Or maybe he could take his donkey and ride up on the south side of Chicago, past the tenements, 
and the chalk outlines. Or maybe he would, we could see him riding to Port-au-Prince, past the burning tires, to the parched hearts. Or maybe we will see him on the streets of Cuba or Venezuela. Or maybe you want to see that donkey and that Jesus show up riding into your kid's house, into their yard. Or maybe you want that Prince of Peace, that King of Righteousness to on the foal of his donkey come right into your very marriage or your very heart. What a spectacular sight that would be. It might stun you into silence. See him riding in your neighborhood to your kid's home, to their marriage, there are wounds that are deep and festering. Ride on, Jesus. Ride on. Bring Lazarus with you. So help my weak faith to believe. Bring us some of that new creation legs. New creation eyes to see. New creation ears to hear. Newly created heart to feel and to love again. We need a new creation kind of God because that's the only thing that's going to save us in this world. There's a song that was sung that came to my mind. It was actually done by Evie. That was the music of my early Christian uh, walk because that's the music my wife listened to. I didn't know Christian music. I knew a lot of Beatles songs. I knew a lot of, of Steely Dan and lots of other stuff. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, a lot of Dan Fogelberg, a lot of you know, betraying it. But there was a song. Oh, maybe I shouldn't sing it. Spare you. Maybe it was a sign. Let's see what happens here. It's an old song. You might know it. If you do, I'd like you to sing along. I don't have the lyrics on the stage, but you might know it. I think Peter was the one who actually wrote it. Ooh, wait. I'm going to spare us. That was not meant to be played. But I'm going to still sing it. It's a song by, he wrote, When I think I'm going under, part the waters, Lord. When I feel the waves around me, calm the sea. When I cry for help, oh, hear me, Lord, and hold out your hand. Touch my life, still the raging storm in me. Let's stand for benediction. Father in heaven, when you showed up, what a difference it made at Lazarus' tomb. What a difference it made to a paralytic lowered through a roof. For a man full of leprosy. For people broken with sin and shame and guilt. You were friends with publicans and sinners who were drowning in their own, or trying to drown out their own failure and sorrow and shame. And you came riding into, your, into their life 
as a humble servant and a burden bearer, and you want us to go and take this gospel to the very farthest ends of the wor world, the gospel that Jesus saves. Save us, Lord, and then help us take this message of salvation So fill us with that spirit that hovered over the chaos and out came the earth, that hovered over Mary and out came Jesus. Hover over our lives and make us those new creatures today. And then help us go to the farthest ends of the earth, preparing a way for you through our testimony, through our words, pointing back to the one who rides on the foal of a donkey. In Jesus' name we praise you, Father. Amen.